welcome to a very special Abney breakfast as we celebrate 150 years of one of the world's greatest cultural institutions, the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Now, 150 years for some context, the year the Met was founded in 1870 was the same year the Franco-Prussian War broke out, the same year John D. Rockefeller founded Standard Oil, and that Congress created the DOJ. Today, Prussia is mostly recognized as the site of one of the largest malls in Pennsylvania. Rockefeller's Standard Oil is long gone, and the DOJ is involving in unusual ways before our eyes. But the Met has not only stayed intact, it has flourished, building a proud legacy as a global center for art, culture, and fashion. It is our country's largest art museum, with nearly seven million visitors to its three locations last year alone. We are so lucky to have this amazing institution and all its works in our city. Abney is honored to be here, celebrating the Met as enter its 150th, and I should say it's been a pleasure working with our longtime Abney Steering Committee member, John Sylvan, and his team from Global Strategies on this event. To Daniel Weiss, the Met's president and CEO, and to its staff and board, including its chairman, Daniel Brodsky, who I'm happy that was here with us today, congratulations on this great milestone. And as passionate and committed New Yorkers, we say thank you. And now it's my pleasure to introduce the Met's president and chief executive officer, Daniel Weiss. He's everything you'd expect from the head of the Met. He's an accomplished art historian, a seasoned leader of complex institutions who started his career as a management consultant. He is unusually well-educated. He holds an MBA from Yale, a BA from George Washington, an MA from Hopkins, a PhD from Hopkins in Western and Medieval Byzantine art. He is also known for being fiscally astute steward and is credited with helping strengthen the finances of the Met so that we're hopefully back here in another 150 years to celebrate another anniversary. So now, here to present on the Met's past, present, and future, someone our city is lucky to have as a cultural leader, Daniel Weiss. Well, good morning. It's a great pleasure to see all of you here. Welcome to the Metropolitan. As you all know, this is the 150th anniversary of this institution. And one of the things I'd like to do this morning in my remarks is talk a little bit about that history. How did we become the institution we are today? It is in many ways a remarkable story, and it is our collective story. This museum has a unique history in the context of cultural institutions around the world. So a little history about this place. The museum was founded in 1870 by a group of New York citizens, businessmen, all who were, I think, on a trip to Paris. And at that time in 1870, New York was a burgeoning metropolis with an increasing successful industrial base and financial base. This was a city with a future. There were resources, but there was, it wasn't a great place to live. It didn't have a strong cultural foundation. And these citizens had the idea that if we're going to build the city we all want to build and create, it must have a strong cultural foundation as well. So they audaciously had the idea while they were in Paris, we should have the Louvre, that's what we need. We need a place like that. They didn't say we should have an art museum, some little art museum that maybe someday, no. Their view was to create one of the greatest art museums in the world. And what's so remarkable about that, audacious really, is uh, they didn't have any art, they didn't have a lot of money, they had nothing. What the Louvre had was a thousand years of a head start in gathering their collections and creating them through royal and imperial collections over time. The same as the Hermitage, the British Museum, all the great museums in the world were built that way, not the way these guys had in mind. They came back and in 1870 the Metropolitan opened. It was a rented building on Fifth Avenue and where the collections were a few works of art that had been gathered and some plaster casts and an ambitious agenda to be able to connect the citizens of New York and the world to art. And it continued to grow and become the, the museum we have today, which is something like 21 buildings knit together over the course of 149 years. Um, and now the building is, the museum is 2.3 million square feet. We are the largest art museum in the world. And, um, Quite an extraordinary achievement, as I say, for the citizens of New York to have created. But more important than the size of the building are the range of the collections and the programs that it houses. The museum has about 2,200 employees. We have an operating budget of $320 million. We have an endowment of about $3.6 billion. We have a collection that is in excess of 1.5 million works of art. Every single one of them was given to us by somebody, or through the resources that people gave us so we can buy them, every one of them. If one thinks about that, it's extraordinary. Today, the museum has uh, 
about seven plus million visitors a year, which is quite extraordinary. And we contribute to the New York economy in ways, in, in, one can measure that in billions, in terms of the kind of revenue that is generated in the city by virtue of the people who come here to visit us from all over the world. And we have, uh, we are the, the most significant tourist attraction in the city of New York. And whenever I say that, my friends from Central Park say, not so fast. And then the people from the High Line say, not so fast. So I would say we are the most significant tourist attraction with a roof. Um, that's the claim we can make. So that's, that's our history that gets us to the present moment. Uh, as all of you know, this museum is a complicated place. We just recently went through a very difficult financial time. Although we have very strong resources, as we've discussed, we found ourselves a few years ago with a significant deficit. This was a function of a variety of complicated factors, which I don't need to rehearse in detail, but our revenues had been flat. We have all these businesses that we engage in that help generate revenue for the institution retail operations, we have six plus restaurants in the building, we do special events, we have a membership program. All of those revenue sources were languishing, they were not growing. The institution's ambitions were growing, our budgets were growing, but our resources were not growing commensurate with them. We think about investing in the infrastructure. 2.3 million square feet, 21 buildings added over the period of 150 years. Think for just one moment if you've ever done any renovation work in your own house the electrical lines, the air handling systems, the plumbing, the sewage, it's complicated and it's expensive. Today the institution is strong, our finances are strong, we're stable, we're looking to the future, we're very excited about this milestone moment in our history. At 150 years we have a great story and we want to lay out a great story for the future and at this moment we're thinking about various ways to do that. We're having what's called a collections initiative which is highlighting the fact that our collections were created, as I said, one gift at a time, and we're, we're focusing on some new and exciting gifts from our friends and supporters. We'll have a major exhibition called Making the Met, which is gonna tell the story of the history of this institution for people to see how we got where we are today. And then we'll be unveiling these various gallery installations that I've been mentioning. And there'll be a party in June, the weekend of June 4th. So we'll have lots of to celebrate there. So I'd like to conclude my remarks with just a few thoughts about philanthropy and what it means for cultural institutions like this one. First of all, we are fundamentally a philanthropic institution. 75% of our resources every year come to us through gifts. That is the cumulative legacy of our endowment, which is gifts over time that we have stewarded, and new gifts every year. Without philanthropy, we are not the Metropolitan Museum of Art or anything like that. And that's true for every major cultural institution in this city. If we were to take away philanthropy, we would not be a cultural powerhouse at all. Our job is not to be a partisan organization. We do not evaluate donors around their political positions, whether we like them, whether we think their politics makes sense. We evaluate donors around their commitment to helping us do what we think, as stewards of this institution, is in its best long-term interest. We're not a club. We are a community resource. We haven't always gotten that right. That is to say, we haven't always been the most welcoming place in the world. But that is our obligation, because collectively, if we think about what philanthropy means and what it means for the community to commit to us and for us to take those resources, we are a public trust. The diversity of funding that we have gives us independence to be a voice in society that allows us to express the freedoms of expression that are central to who we are. It forces us to be accountable. If we're not accountable, we're not getting money. We have to be able to be accountable to those people who care about us. And also, and this is perhaps less obvious, if you have a philanthropic model, you have to think about the institution from a strategic and long-term perspective because you need to be making a compelling case for the investment people are making in you. And thoughtful people want to know that. We cannot easily raise money to fix a leaking ceiling because we didn't think of it before. Anybody who's ever tried to raise money knows that is not happening. People invest in vision and in a dream. And that's, so for all those reasons, the philanthropic, philanthropic model is, we believe, the right one. But I would acknowledge there is a line. We wouldn't take money from anybody for anything. That's for sure. We wouldn't have a gallery of the Friends of Mussolini in the museum. That's just not happening. We wouldn't do that for various reasons. So we all know there is a line somewhere. We just have to figure that out one institution at a time through consultation with our board, and this is where I'll cl conclude my remarks, that ultimately what allows institutions to be successful in managing themselves and in raising money in this way is through consultation with the board 
Shared governance is at the center of what allows um, mission-driven institutions to be successful. So what we do is we consult on these questions, we try to find the collective wisdom of our board, and then we make decisions that we think are right for us. They may not be exactly right for some other place, but ultimately we believe in accountability and transparency in our decision making. So whatever we decide, we're going to talk about it to the public, answer questions, and ultimately try to find truth and the best way forward by doing what we think is right and being accountable to those who have questions. Even if ultimately we don't all agree. Protesters can come and say they don't agree with us, that's fine, totally fine. But it doesn't mean we have to do what they say just because they don't agree with us. We have the right to have a thoughtful discussion and debate about what it is that we think is best for the institution. In the end, what we're seeking to do is to preserve an institution that is unique in the world. Because when people come here, it heightens their empathy. It increases their understanding of the world. It helps them to see where they fit into a magnificent history of human civilization that is larger than themselves and that people they might not know anything about have histories and traditions and values that are important to them as well. And so there's one place in the world that does that like the Met does. And our investment in the future is an investment in the strength and vision of what civilization can mean to all of us. And we are one of the only places in the world where anybody can come from anywhere and be welcome in a safe place to find community, growth, and the opportunity to learn. And that's what we will invest in in the future. Thank you very much. You've got 5,000 years of art. It's a very ambitious um, project to try and sort of capture that much. And it belongs on some level to humanity as a whole. The trustees of your board, um, do they sort of feel that on an active level? Our trustees, like all of us who work here, we're in many ways in awe of this institution and what it represents. So we talk about that a lot. Many of our trustees have their own particular interest in one form of art or another but they deeply appreciate the magnificence and breadth of our collections and how important it is to have, we often call it an encyclopedic museum. It's not actually an encyclopedic museum. I'll come back to that in a second. They often invest in things that are not their particular interest, that we're, we're gonna do one gallery renovation or another. I mentioned a few today. People have funded that from our board who are not necessarily interested in those things, but they're interested in the collective enterprise and what it brings. Just one more brief comment. This idea of an encyclopedic museum changes all the time. When the museum opened in the first few decades, it was almost all European and American art, and that was our global institution. We have 17 curatorial departments today, two of which represent 75% of the planet. So we're evolving. That, that's just the historical artifact of the growth of the institution. We'd like to collect the best examples of art of every culture over all of history. We don't have that yet, but that's the path we're on, and we have a ways to go. As far as um, dollars, you, you mentioned that 75% uh, uh, of it comes from gifts and philanthropy, about 9% from government. I'm detecting a gap. What, what happens with that last 15, 16%? So we have a series of revenue generating activities, which I had mentioned earlier. And uh, we have restaurants and a retail operation. We do some special events. We have a membership program. Collectively, those, those activities are intended in the first instance to enrich and um, support the visitor's experience. When people come to the museum, we want every part of their visit to be welcoming. And so that includes having a good place to eat at an affordable price, maybe going into the shop and buying something. But all of those activities collectively also represent a significant revenue source for us. And um, the, uh, the measurement of success that you spend the most time on is what? I mean, I know attendance at a big blockbuster exhibition is, is something you're very proud of. Is that sort of your main metric? No, it's a wonderful question. One of the great challenges of running any mission-driven institution is how do you measure whether you're there or not, or you're making progress. Uh, I used to be in higher education, and I can tell you that everybody who led a university hated US News, because they were the ones who seemed to decide whether you're doing better or not, whether you rise in those rankings or not. And by the way, what difference does it make whether you're 11 or 14? It does to the trustees who say, you know, we gotta be 11. It's hard to measure, and in a cultural institution like this one, we look at many things. We want to make sure that our visitation numbers are the right numbers, that is to say that we're, we're attracting a diverse range of the population. If our numbers were to go down, but the quality of the visitor experience was strong and there were reasons for that, that's fine. 
getting this place jammed up with people does not create the best visitor experience. And if every of you have been, any of you have been to the Louvre and you want to go on the march to the Mona Lisa, not the most sublime museum experience you'll ever have. And the Louvre knows it. It's a problem for them. So we think about visitation, we think about, we, we, about, we do surveys of visitors' uh, satisfaction and what they think of the experience. We look at our finances. There are certain preconditions to success. A balanced budget is an obligation, as I said, to the future of the institution, but that's not what we're aiming for. What we're aiming for is growth in our collections in a thoughtful way, the production of meaningful new scholarship in the world that enriches and enlivens what we know about our cultural history, and visitor experiences that are among the finest that one can imagine. How do you um, select your trustees? I noticed as I was looking through the list that some are listed as elected trustees, and I was wondering who's doing the electing, and yeah. I assume it's a self-perpetuating board, but could you explain that Yes, a it is. We have a large and complicated board consisting of three categories, uh, four categories of trustees. We have about, currently about 104 trustees, all of them. We have elective trustees who have ultimate fiduciary responsibility for the institution. So it is their core responsibility to make sure that we're meeting those obligations. There are about 40 to 45 of those. We have emeritus trustees who are trustees who had been elective trustees. We have honorary trustees who are elected for various reasons to the board in a non-governance context, but to participate in the work of the board and be part of that community. And then we have ex officio trustees who are selected uh, in partnership with the city. So overall, it's a large group. One of the things that we think carefully about is how do you do real, meaningful, shared governance when you have a board of 104 people? It's complicated. We have a committee structure that allows us to do a lot of that, um, but that's what the board consists of. And I, it's selected by, by a nominating and governance committee. There were a lot of um, really well-known names on that board, and I think I stopped counting at about 10. Um, you've got at least that many billionaires on the board. I'm wondering how you manage the, for lack of a better word, just the, the egos of, of those kind of folks. When I was first appointed to this job, a colleague of mine who works in universities said, they, he did the same thing, he looked at that list, and he said, buddy, you're in for it. How are you gonna deal with that? And it's really interesting. This institution, for them, is the same as it is for everybody else. They're inspired to be part of it, and whatever they're like, Elsewhere, they don't bring that here. They are, they, they, it's a remarkable thing. They all want to help the institution. They all want to participate. They all have respect, even reverence, for what this place represents. And to be sure, I'm, I'm sure there are people out there who wouldn't be like that, but we don't put them on our board. We have a lot of wealthy people, but that's not the only reason. That's not the main reason. So there's a certain kind of self-check that there's a larger set of objectives here there's something really powerfully um, inspiring for people to be part of an institution with this mission. And it's, it, billionaires feel it, elementary school kids feel it. So this is, of all the boards I've been involved in, this is an easy one that way, it really is. Oh, okay, I imagine it's probably easier to have 10 than, than one, right? So oh, there's no question, balance. yes, that's yeah. exactly right. <laughs> um, there was some reporting about the Sackler family, which um, had connections to, uh, opioids and a number of different kind of political and legal questions arose around that. Yes. How do you handle something like that? The Sackler family collectively has been involved at this museum for more than a half a century. And many of the gifts that we received from them were given long before Purdue Pharma was created, well before OxyContin was invented. And were, so there's no association whatsoever in terms of those gifts with that history. But then, and now today, there are Sacklers who have nothing to do with those issues, and there are other Sacklers who are very, very much at the center of that. And so increasingly, the question came before us, is this a place where we should draw a line, where maybe there, we shouldn't be working closely with the Sacklers or accepting, accepting gifts from them? So we did what I described. We convened a group of trustees and staff to have an honest and open discussion on this question, inviting the different perspectives about how do we think about that, how do, the, how do these issues relate to our mission. We acknowledge in the first instance that this is a terrible public tragedy, unspeakably awful public tragedy, that has not yet been litigated in the courts. We don't know exactly what everybody did. That, and it's not for us to decide, a couple of art historians in an art museum, whether or not that Sackler or that Sackler is guilty of crimes that we don't have evidence to judge. So we recognize that we have incomplete information, but at the same time, 
there is a very fundamental issue here and we need to make, we, we need to make a statement about what our values are. So we had this deliberation and we decided in light of those factors that we will suspend receiving any gifts from Sacklers who are in any way connected to Purdue Pharma or to OxyContin. And others, historically, it's, that it's not for us to reverse history, and if, if we want to have a conversation about the robber barons at the turn of the century, we can decide what to do about Andrew Carnegie, and I don't know, does anything have his name in New York? We should probably think about that. These are complicated questions about how one begins to engage in historical inquiry on issues around which values are evolving. When I was younger, you'd come here and it would say, pay what you wish, you must pay something. Um, that was determined to be an, an unsustainable model for a lot of institutions, including this one. Um, what have the results of that been now that there's kind of a sort of a firmer approach to what happens when you walk in the door? We took a close look, an analytically driven, thoughtful look at what we were, how that program was working. And what we discovered is over the last 10 years prior to the admissions policy change, that the actual amount people were paying declined by 67%. And so effectively, the policy was failing. It wasn't allowing us to fund the institution. And as we were talking about this, there were, lots, as you know, lots of commentary about this question. For example, Alexandra Schwartz in the New, York, New Yorker magazine wrote, and she said, this is my favorite cultural institution in the world. I come all the time. I love this place. But when I come, I pay five bucks. So I said to her, you're the problem. You're not a member. And if you, if you pay what you wish, and you have the ability to pay more, and you're not paying enough to help sustain the institution, then who should? Who should, who should we ask de Blasio to do that? You know, who should do that? And we decided that we would maintain pay as you wish for New Yorkers, because New Yorkers support us now through your tax dollars in the ways we've described. 9% of our budget comes from the city. And we're a community resource. We want people to feel they can come and go as they wish who live here. People beyond New York who come for visits are perfectly prepared to pay for cultural experiences. They pay to go to the movies, they pay to go to the theater, they pay to go to MoMA, and so therefore we went through this process. The, to, to conclude this narrative, we changed the policy and every goal we had for it was achieved. Our visitor numbers continued to grow. There was no diminishment, zero, in the diversity of our visitors who come to the institution. And the financial goals that we set, which were to increase our revenues sufficiently to find balance across the spectrum of revenues we need, was achieved. What should people here uh, take away from uh, this morning about the best way to support your institution? Membership is a wonderful way to do it because it connects people to more than just discrete visits to the institution. As a member, you have access to just greater information about what's going on here. So let's go back to that number 38,000. There are a lot of things that people can do. And if you're a member, you can circle in and out. You can come in for a lecture or go to see a special exhibition for a half an hour. And we want people to feel that this museum is their museum. Come up the stairs, come on in, you're welcome to be here. And members feel they know the place better, they're not intimidated by the place, they, they know the range of programming that we have. And so we think that is an ideal way for people to be connected to the museum for their benefit and ours. You, you um, are a former college president. You alluded to the idea of, of, of challenging people intellectually and not being afraid of the blowback and you know, maybe taking some risks. Um, how does that work its way through your governance process? Who, who's involved in the conversation about, hey, let's do something that's gonna mean something, it's gonna annoy a lot of people, but it's still worth doing? Well, I start with the premise that if you work in a mission-driven institution in a leadership position, and this may not be as obvious as it sounds, really understand what that mission is, what the implications of that mission are, so imagine for a moment leading a cultural institution or a university and not believing deeply that freedom of expression is important, worth fighting for, being uncomfortable around. Think about the long-term consequences of that kind of problem. So I come out of higher education and as, uh, as Jennifer knows and others who, who lead, uh, lead universities and colleges, you really don't have a lot of power. It is a political position you have to win over the students and the faculty and the alumni and the trustees and the city representatives. That's where value in leadership comes from. The capacity to engage people in thoughtful collective enterprise to make change. And that's what I brought here, that view. And I think um, when we, so we work, when we think about what kind of a program we want to develop or what our issues are, Max Holine, the director, and I think carefully about that. We engage our trustees and senior leadership and the staff of the museum 
as much as we possibly can. Let me give you one quick case in point. The admissions policy was as controversial internally as it was in the world. Many of our staff were absolutely opposed to this idea. This isn't the mat I love. So we spent an enormous amount of time listening to our staff. Ken Wine and some other members of our staff had, I think, 43 open meetings with staff. I think that's the right number, Ken. To hear their thoughts, to understand their issues, to talk about this. And eventually we reached a place where we learned from them. They understood where we were. And maybe not every person was behind it, but they understood it and they recognized that. Shared governance is slow and inefficient work, but ultimately if you engage in it thoughtfully, then people get behind what that ultimate vision is and it leads to productive and sustainable change. And that's what we do on every issue and therefore if we're gonna find ourselves in controversial space, maybe around the Sacklers or some other issue, you're well advised to do that work ahead of time so that your, your, your position is stronger and more thoughtful and your support system is there.